Greetings Metalheads, welcome to another edition of the Friday 13th YouTube channel. Today you're going to be watching an interview with French metal act, progressive metal band called Spheric Universe Experience. This was conducted by keyboard player Fred. Now if you haven't heard the band before, they're a combination of Symphony X, Dream Theatre, Evergrey, some random plus, some really good bands. So they've got a new album out, which is up released on Uprising Records called Back Home. It's a fantastic album, check it out. Thanks for watching and thanks to Fred for doing the interview. Stay safe, metal heads. Cheers. So I'd like to thank you, Frederick, for doing this interview. So, Fred, I'm going to ask you some warm-up questions first, like I do with all musicians. So, okay. first of all, could you tell me, was the keyboard your first instrument? And if not, what instrument came first for you and at what age? Um, okay, to be uh, accurate, uh, keyboard were not my first interview, uh, my first instrument, sorry. It yeah. was piano. And it's not quite the same. Uh, between piano and synthesizers. So uh, in Sphere Universe Experience, I'm playing uh, keyboards, synthesizers, uh, but my very first instrument is piano. But of course, it's pretty much the same. The keys are the same, as you can see. It's uh, it's uh, piano keys, but it's it's quite different. But yeah, I started piano lessons when I was six. To be honest, I, I don't even remember my first lesson. I was two years. I was not even six. I was five and three quarters or so. So um, my mom actually um, wanted me to, to have piano lessons. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't even remember the first lessons. I was, I was too young. So it's been you know my it, it, it's like a sec it's like a mother language. Music to me is like the mother, a mother language. It's something that you learn from a very young age and you don't even remember learning it. Um, so that's pretty much what happened to me. <laughs> okay then, so who inspired you to become a keyboard player? Which keyboard players inspired you? Um, well, it's obviously uh, Kevin Moore from Dream Theatre. Uh, when I was uh, at the college, when I was a teenager, I started listening to uh, Dream Theater and I was uh, blown away by the beautiful keyboard layers that uh, Kevin Moore was able to create. And uh, I remember back then I said, OK, this is exactly what I want to play in a band. I, I was playing in um, the college rock band and we were playing covers, but, you know, we were playing uh, uh, rock covers, uh, Bon Jovi and things like these with uh, cool keyboard stuff. but. You know, it was basic keyboard parts. And then I discovered Liquid Tension Experiment, Dream Theater, Symphony X. I said, okay, this is exactly what I want to play in, in the keyboards in a rock band, in a metal band. So we started playing. Um, when I was 17, I, I joined uh, a Dream Theater cover band. And we started playing this uh, this specific genre, and then it turned to in turned into a very humorous experience a couple of years later, and the rest is history. <laughs> okay, then, sir, so, that's pretty cool. Interesting to know. So, what was your first um, professional band you was in? Was it the band you're in now, or was it somebody before that? Well, um, the first band that I had was that Dream Theater cover band, uh, but it was not a professional band. I, I mean, yeah, we 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 played a couple of. Uh, gigs, uh, they paid us some little money, but I mean, we, we couldn't call ourselves uh, professional professional musicians back then. So I would say that my yeah, my very first professional uh, band project was a very generous experience from 2002. It was 20 years ago. So I noticed in the background you've got some guitars there. Is it bass guitar or electric guitars? Yeah, I've got a bass guitar, uh, acoustic guitar, and many keyboards. <laughs> okay, then. So do you actually play bass guitar as well, just to get some ideas for the keyboards? Well, uh, yeah. Actually, um, it's not it's not bass guitar giving me ideas for the keyboards. It's the other way around, actually. Uh, on the bass guitar, I'm, I'm playing uh, my left hand on the piano and I'm, you know, um, playing the same lines that I'm playing with my left hand. Um, yeah, I, lo I love playing the bass. You know, when you're a, a piano player, you have the double education. You are uh, educated on trebles and on bass, trebles on your right hand and bass on your left hand. So we are kind of double musicians. We are, we, we are a guitar player on our left, on our right hand and we are a bass player on our left hand. So we have this double approach of, of music um, with a, a very wide range of notes on the piano. So uh, in, in fact, when you're a piano player, you are a bass player. You are half a bass player. So it was natural to me when I was like 20, 22 years old 
uh, to grab a bass and start playing the bass because it was just the uh, the uh, the natural um, uh, following to my uh, piano uh, culture. Okay, then. So getting back to to your keyboard influences, you said Kevin Moore. Other 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 keyboard players inspired you besides Kevin Moore? Um, well, all the piano players from the prog metal uh, world, of course, Jordan Ruders, Derek Sherinian, Michael Pinella, um, uh, Rio Okumoto from Spoxbeard, who is uh, currently touring, um, and also some uh, different piano players, like uh, synthesizers players, like Jean-Michel Jarre, French musician. Um, my mom was a fan of uh, Jarre, and she was uh, she actually uh, made me listen to his, to his music when I was a, a kid. So he's been an influence way before progressive keyboard players, actually. So uh, yeah. Um, th these would be the guys that come to my mind uh, as my main influences. So when you say you play the keyboards, you know, like jean michel Jarre, do you actually wear the gloves where his lasers touch your hand? <laughs> I never had the opportunity to play such an instrument. Uh, the only fancy instrument that I play is a uh, guitar, the shoulder keyboard. Uh, I'm using it quite a lot uh, on stage because uh, it's the opportunity for us keyboard players to become mobile musicians on stage because we are we are stuck behind our, our instrument like a drummer. Uh, we have a fixed instrument, and um, when you wear your your guitar, it's it's a whole new world because you become like a guitar player. You you come uh, in the front of the stage and you can move uh, back and forth in the stage, and it's a it's a whole different way uh, to play live music for a keyboard player. So yeah, so yeah, the only fancy instrument that I'm, I'm playing is a is a shoulder keyboard. So what, what metal keyboard players, progressive metal keyboard players are inspired you? Obviously, obviously Covey Moore has been the big one for you. What other ones? Is there any other ones that have inspired you? Yeah, as I told you, all the Dream Theatre keyboard players, Derek Sherinian, Jordan Rudis, of course, but also Michael Pinella from Symphony X, with, uh, as, as he has a very soft and romantic style. Um, he, he can play uh, heavenly pianos in the middle of a total chaos with a heavy riffs and you know a whole a whole lot of instruments all around in, in heavy metal chaos and he's he's uh, adding some very sweet and soft and heavenly layers over it and this is something that speaks a lot to me because uh, in real life I'm a very sweet guy you know I'm, I'm not I'm not the big man with a big big arms and you know, I'm not I'm not that, that kind of man. I'm I'm extremely soft and romantic. So um, I, I was very influenced by keyboard players who are able to add this romantic style to uh, such a, a manly genre as a heavy metal. So what do you think of like Jens Johansson, like a former Ingve keyboard player? Well. Um, I intentionally didn't mention uh, Jens Johansson because. Of course, he he's one of the greatest uh, heavy metal keyboard player of, of all time. Um, he actually set his own sound, uh, lead sound especially to uh, to the world of uh, melodic metal. So uh, huge respects to this guy. But um, his um, his sound and his melodies never really touched me, to be honest. But once again, he's a legend, and uh, I would love to meet him and. Um, I mean, what, he, he's he's a, once again he's one of the pioneers of a uh, heavy metal keyboard. But yeah, he I, I couldn't name him as an influence to me. Yeah, I met him a couple of times. Nice guy. Yeah, definitely. I guess yeah. so. What do you think of Richard from uh, Evergrey? Is he kind of an influence to you? Inspired. I love what he does. I love what he does. I'm a big fan of Evergrey. Um, the thing is, in Evergrey, keyboards are not that. Um, present and important as uh, in other progressive metal bands. There are very uh, little lead parts. It's more about uh, strings and, and pads and, you know... Um, yeah, the atmosphere, the atmospheric. The, the atmosphere, absolutely, which is beautiful, which is something that I, I love doing as well. I mean, it's not about just playing lead synths and solos. Of course, you need to be able to play different things. And uh, Ricard from uh, Evergrey, he's he's very good at that. Um, I love what he does as well. Yeah. 
Well, okay then, great, because I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of like, progressive metal bands like yourself. I mean, one of my favourite bands is Psychotic Waltz and Fate's Warning. Yeah. You know? Yeah. These are legends as well. <laughs> you know, to, to me, like, Psychotic Waltz is so underrated. Like, awesome musicians. Yeah. Very, very strange music, but very uh, intense, Definitely. very, you know. But I'll, I'll, is... I'll... Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. The thing is that bands like these, uh, they play music that is so complex that it, it can never be mainstream and it can never have um, uh, popular media coverage. So they will forever remain underrated because, I mean, that's because of their own music. That's how it is, unfortunately. I mean, I'll get, get to the, the band, the Spherix Experiment, Universe Experiment. I mean, who came up with the name? So you can risk experience, not yeah, experiment. Sorry, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, well, the name, you know, it was 20 years ago. We were, we were young musicians. We were progressive metal nerds. And when it came to, we actually composed the whole first album before even having a band name. So when we finished uh, composing the album and we said, okay, now we need to, we need to shop the album to lay to the labels, but we need to have a band name and we need to have a logo and we need to actually create the band because we only had the music, but we didn't have a, actually a band identity. So it was 20 years ago. We had, I, I was, I was 18 or 19 years old. When you're a progressive metal fan, and you're that young, um, and you are searching for a band name. You said, "Okay, we need a band, that, a band name that uh, reflects the complexity of our music, and we need a band name that is not just easy to to, to understand. We need something, you know, uh, with many words and many letters, and it has to be as complex as the music." So, actually, I um, Vince Benaim, the guitar player, came up with the Spheric Universe, and I said, "What about?" adding experience to it and that's just the way it happened nothing else <laughs> we just decided okay sorry you know experience it sounds great it sounds progressive metal okay let's go for it right because i was just reading your biography was it used to be called amnesia at one point yeah this was the um, the progressive metal cover band that we had we had right. before okay. and actually uh, spheric universe experience was formed by three members of amnesia myself guitarist Vince Bennering and, and bass player John Dre. And we we were fed up with playing covers and we said, at, at, at what point we said, okay, now we want to write our own music. Playing covers is, is fine, it's cool, but we, we want to create an album, we want to create our own music. So we said to the, the remaining two members, do you guys want to follow us and, and create a, an actual band and create an album? And they were not motivated, so we parted ways with those two guys, and uh, we found a, another drummer and and uh, vocalist, respectively, and we formed Spheric Universe Experience with uh, three members of Amnesia. That's All right, story. yeah. I mean, I was just like looking. I mean, you do gas formed in nineteen ninety nine. Is that correct? As the band you are now. Well, yeah. The very roots of Amnesia date back to nineteen ninety nine. Right. So say, obviously, you three guys were that confident and you thought, well, why, why be in a dream theater cover band when we could do our own songs? That, that's exactly what we said to ourselves at that time. Um, and we do not regret our choice because, uh, you know, um, our decision has led us to, uh, to release five uh, studio albums, one live album, to make three European tours, to play a festival in the U.S., I mean, we, we, we've been doing so many things that we would never have done with any other band, any other local band. So uh, we, we, we made the right decision back then, 20 years ago. I mean, the name, like I say, is Phoenix Universe Experiments. Was that the only name that you had? Or did you have any other names? Because it's quite a long title for people to remember. Yeah, we know. But th this was the point. We wanted a name that was not easy to remember it's the opposite of what it has to be from a commercial standpoint um it's it's absurd uh, commercially but uh progressive metal is absurd so it has it had to reflect the genre that we were playing so yeah yeah this is this was as i told you this was the only name that we came up with uh we again vince said what, what about the universe i said okay let's add uh, experience to it and that's how the, the name was found Simple as that. <laughs> oh, wow, because I was looking like, you've had a hell of a lot of drummers. You've gone through a hell of a lot of drummers, but the rest of the band has stayed solid. What's, what's been the problem with the drummers? Well, 
in our region, we, we are based in Nice, French Riviera. And uh, in our region, there are very, uh, there are not many drummers, especially in this uh, very specific genre, which is progressive metal. Um, and the thing is that, yeah, we, we never managed to, um, to, to keep a, a drummer for a very long time. Well, the one that we have now, Romain Goulon, has been in the band since uh, 2015. So it's been six plus years now. So hopefully he will, he, he's already the longest drummer in the history of the band. So hopefully he will stay for even longer. But yeah, before him, we, we had uh, three drummers who stayed uh, maximum four years and, and then they wanted to, to have other experiences. So yeah, this is the only um, department that uh, we, we had to change in the history of the band. But the rest of the musicians are the original ones. Right then, so how many demos did you do as a band? I believe you did a, a demo called The Burning Box. Was that correct? In 2002, uh, when we parted ways with the cover band and we created Serenious Experience, we, um, so we rewrote those uh, uh, first songs and we recorded the demo. Um, and actually, this demo was never released. It was only a couple of labels and management uh, and this is uh, the, with this demo we actually uh, found the contract with the instrumental management yeah i used to know, then, I know klaus i know klaus and so klaus jensen is the yeah. one who actually I, I mean klaus jensen is the man to whom we owe everything about sorry your experience if klaus was if it was not for klaus i wouldn't be there tonight speaking with you I mean, he's the one. He actually, he's the one who who signed us just with our demo, the Burning Box, back in two thousand and three. Um, he listened to the demo and and he he just believed in us, and he was the only one believing in us back then. So uh, and then he made possible for us to sign with a label and to release the first album and then the second and then the rest of our of our career. But he's the starting point. Klaus Jensen is the starting point to 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 my band. So I will be forever grateful to him because once again, I wouldn't be there uh, chatting with you tonight if it was not for him. Okay, then. so we're going to talk about the first album, um, The Mental Torment, which was released on Nightmare Records. Was that the only label that approach you signed to or was he a different label in Europe? Um, we had, Yes, uh, we had a special deal for France. We had a, a, a specific label for France, which was a re uh, Replica Records with uh, Olivier Garnier. Maybe you heard of him. Yeah, another label. So, uh, yeah, it was the label of Angra, Freak Kitchen. It was a great label. And we, we were actually the smallest band in, uh, in a big label, but that, that was great. Um, so, yeah, he, he, he had a, a distribution for France, and then uh, Nightmare Records had um, uh, North America. Right then, so how well did the first album sell for you, and what's your favourite songs from the first album? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, I don't remember the, the sales uh, reports from the first album, but um, it, it was it was a fair success for a first album by a, a French progressive metal band. And my favorite track. It's always difficult to add, to, to to ask this question to uh, to a musician because uh, logically you, you love each and every track that you compose. Um, I would say. I mean, maybe I would say uh, the um, the long the, the long the longest song, which is "Mental Torments," uh, the fifteen minute long track. Um, yeah, maybe this is my favorite uh, song from the debut album. But I I, I love all of the songs. It's kind of weird because progressive metal bands always seem to do long songs. I don't know why they're just thirty minutes, forty five minutes, twelve minutes. It's just. I guess it's because it's just complex, the songs. It's complex and it's part of a tradition. Uh, actually, from the very beginning in the 60s and 70s, um, progressive rock bands and then later progressive metal bands always refused to stick to the uh, the radio format, which was three minutes, three, three, thirty, four minutes. Um, they always refused to stick to that uh, imposed format and they wanted to uh, be free to develop a whole 
concept in a song or in an album without any uh, time limit. So we are part of this legacy. Right, okay, then. So we're going to talk about the second album next. Anima, yeah, sorry, that was released on Ceremony Records. I mean, that's Ken Goldsworth's label. So why did you leave Nightmare Records? Did Lance offer you a second deal, or do you just decide to go with a, a bigger well, label? Well, um, to be honest, we are not the ones dealing with the, the contracts and the label. It's instrumental management. Um, and Klaus Jensen and Lars Larsen, who have been uh, dealing with this... Uh, on behalf of the band for the past uh, 19, 19, 20 years. So uh, to be honest, I don't even remember how we ended up uh, switching labels and and, um, and signing with the sensory, but it probably uh, Klaus and Lars uh, had found a better deal for us. Um, and they believed that we could achieve more things uh, by working with the sensory rather than uh, nightmare records so um actually we we shifted uh, labels and it was great to release two two albums anima and unreal with uh, ken golden he's a great guy he's uh, very much respected in the industry and he's been doing a great job for us with those two albums yeah i remember meeting him in Je in america at the power mad festival back in 97 and he's, he had some really good bands like zero hour redemption lalo who he signed lalo another french band so he, had some, he had some good progressive metal bands but under his belt. Yeah, absolutely. And we were extremely honoured uh, to become a part of his roster when we signed uh, to Sensory in, in uh, 2007. Okay, so, so from that album, which did you have any favourite songs from the second album? Well, first of all, you need to know that uh, Anima is the fan favourite album of uh, Sphere Genius Experience. So far, it might change with the new album. <laughs> I hope so. But uh, before Back Home was released, I know that Anima was the fan favorite. So now the question, which is my favorite song from the fan favorite album? Um, here again, it's, you know, in cinema, they call it killing babies when you have to, you know, you have multiple takes from a scene and all takes are beautiful and you need to pick just one and let go of the others. They call that killing babies. And that's pretty much the same here. When you ask me to pick one song, um, rather than all others, uh, it's like killing babies because all those songs are my babies, so our babies, not just mine. Um, I think the best song from anime is um, The Inner Quest because it's uh, perfectly representative of the whole sound of SUE. It includes each and every element that uh, composes our uh, style. Right then, so I mean, that next album that you did was called Unreal, obviously with Ken Goldsworth again. Who produced that album? Was it Tommy Hansen? Nope. It was a local pre French producer and it was mastered in the US by um, some guy called uh, Duchess uh, from West West Music. His uh, last name is Douches. I don't remember his first name. Anyway, he was mastered in the US, but the production, recording and mix was uh, done here in France with a uh, local French producer. Because yeah, uh, the second album was done by Tommy Hansen. Once he had something to do with that, it was wet with pretty Halloween, pretty maids, a lot of good bands. Yeah, uh, Tommy Hansen, and we are grateful to him because once again, if it was not for these initial guys on the very uh, first uh, days uh, and years of our history we would not be where we are today so uh, we owe quite a lot to those guys so the, so the second album manimal and unreal how, who came up with the titles and did you have any other titles for those two albums well from what i remember because the uh, those are albums that are 15 years old so uh, it's pretty um long memories but um no it, it was obvious anima it, it was we needed we wanted a, an album title that was not a track title unlike the first album because we're always uncomfortable uh, naming an album uh the same way as one of the tracks because you always uh, mix up between both mental torments we had all we, we always have to specify uh the mental torments the song or the album and this is something that we no longer wanted for the next albums so um if you 
look at this. Uh, we we called Anima because we called the album Anima because uh, it was not a track title, and we wanted something very different. Unreal, it's the same. It's it was a concept album about paranormal phenomenon, and we wanted one uh, word to summarize the whole concept about paranormal phenomenon. So uh, Unreal was the perfect name. Okay, then the next time you did, you went back to Nightmare Records for the New Eve. Yeah. Well, why did you go back to uh, Nightmare Records? What happened there? Um, we had a two album contract with a sensory and we completed it and it was not uh, renewed. So uh, instrumental management took us back to um, Nightmare Records with Lance King. Uh, and we released the new wave on, on this album. And we also released the, the live album, Live in London 2016. Yeah, I'm going to, talk to, you about, I'm going to talk to you about that in a moment. So, <laughs> so when you go look back at the first four albums, how do you see each album as a progression? Well, um, there are three the first three albums and the new eve and probably as you as you as you know the new eve is quite different actually we were on a raising um direction from mental performance to anima to unreal and then uh, on the fourth album we made the decision to slightly move away from uh, the traditional melodic progressive metal that we had been writing so far and we wanted to try some heavier approach um so the new eve is a little bit less progressive and a little bit more metal um unfortunately it turned out to be a bad decision because uh, our fans didn't enjoy this uh change um and it, it turned out to be a mistake from us so the first four albums, I would say, there are the three, the first three albums, which are consistent and uh, a real progression. And then uh, there is the uh, the New Eve accident where we we made a mistake um, and uh, uh, we actually took the wrong direction. This is why we wanted with the fifth album to get back to our roots, to get back to melodic progressive metal to get back to where we belong. And this is why we called the album back home. But I guess we will uh, get back to it in a couple of minutes. Okay, and so we're going to talk about this live EP. I mean, you did it in London. Why did you record an EP in London when you could have done a full album? Well, um, the London gig was the last uh, concert of our second European tour with Threshold in 2016. Um, we had we have been touring twice with Threshold, um, and the second tour we had this last gig in London, and a couple of minutes it, it was absolutely not planned. We didn't know when we arrived in London on the very morning. We ignored that we would be recording our very first live album here, so it it was totally improvised. Actually, when we arrived to the venue. Um, the guys from Threshold told us, okay, tonight uh, the, the sound engineer is, go is going to record the show. And it can, he can even re record your tracks and your show because we were the opening slot. So usually uh, you don't have those um, privilege. I mean, the, the headliner gets recorded, but not, not the, the opening band. And on that night, they told us, I mean, in in the very beginning of the day, they told us, okay, um, there will be a recording. So if you guys want to, to get back home with the tracks, just ask the, uh, the engineer and he will give you the tracks. And I said, okay, we've been talking with the guys. We said, okay, there will be a recording. What, what do we do? And we decided to, uh, to say, okay, we'll get the tracks, we'll have them mixed, and we will tell our label if it's possible to release our first ever live release. And uh, Lance King was uh, fine with the, the idea and he released uh, SUE live in London 2016. But once again, it was decided like in the early afternoon when we arrived in London, we, we didn't know that we would be recording our first ever live album that night. Wow. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to talk about the new album then. So the new album's called Back Home and you've signed mm -hmm. up to uh, a new label, obviously. So Uprising Records, how did you get involved with Uprising? 
Um, our manager Laos from Intromental Management has been working a couple of months with uh, Uprising Records um, and he uh, simply submits uh, our album to the label and they say okay we are uh, okay to release it. It's as simple as that. So it was just our manager who was working with the, the label and we are very 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 happy to be working with this new label because they are extreme, extremely dedicated. Uh, they are serious about what they do. Um, they work very well and we are very lucky to, to have this contract with them and I'm extremely glad that we are working with them now. So is the, is the label Uprising, is it part of Mighty Music, a Danish label? It's part of Target. Target, yeah. Danish label. Target, right, okay. it's yeah, right. Label. Yeah. It's the heavy metal subdivision of Target. Right, okay then. So are you happy with the way things are turning out with you and the label so far? Absolutely delighted. Uh, once again, they work in a very serious way, very dedicated. Um, they are actually... We, we are having one of the best promotion that we ever had on any SUE album. So uh, maybe... From a promotional standpoint, this is maybe the best label we've ever worked with. So, yeah, I'm extremely satisfied so far. So, where was this album recorded and who produced the album? It was produced by a French guy, but not living here in France with us. He's in California. His name is Damien Renault, and he's been producing bands like Fear Factory, uh, Dragon Force in the past couple of years. So quite big names. Um, and he's uh, more and more famous in the heavy metal industry in the, in the, the West Coast of the US. So uh, it was the perfect match for us, the perfect profile, because he's French. Um, and he is uh, in the US. He's more and more involved in the heavy metal scene. So uh, it was the perfect guy for this project. And he, he delivered. He delivered some beautiful production to the album, so he confirmed he was the the best fit. Okay, so was this album recorded in in your home studio, and the guitarist did his work in his studio? How did it come about? This album with COVID situation. Well, as I told you, the uh, the album was recorded uh, prior to COVID, but yeah, we recorded it in in our home studio. Every track was uh, every instrument was recorded at home and then it was mixed and mastered in the professional studio of Damien Renault in California. Right then, so are you happy with the way the album turned out and which are your favourite songs from this album so far? I am more than happy about the end result. Uh, the album, to me, it is the absolute best offering that we had so far. The best album of Spirit Universe experience so far. Um, my favorite uh, song here again, it's very difficult to name one song, especially as this is a concept album. So it's not like multiple separate songs. It's one big uh, concept, one big story. So actually it's not 13 tracks. It's one 70 minutes track. So it's very difficult to pick one section of uh, this uh, uh, big concept album but if I have to pick one song I would say Where We Belong um, because this is the track that we uh, made the official video with um, and it's maybe the, the track that is most representative of the whole album in terms of uh, energy, in terms of melody in terms of uh, atmosphere Where We Belong maybe is my favorite track but once again my favorite track of back home is back home actually it's the whole album okay then so the album cover is really really good who did the artwork for this album um it's the work of matthias noren from sweden he's a very famous progressive uh artist he's been doing uh, cd covers for hundreds literally hundreds of uh, progressive metal and progressive rock bands uh, his website is called progart.com. Oh, yeah, I know it. And he's, I, I, get, I guess you know him. He's world famous. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's been in the business for the past 25 years. Um, and he actually, the story is that he was the one uh, 
designing our uh, debut album cover on Mental Torments. He made the cover of Mental Torments. And um, unfortunately, we, we stopped working with him from the second album. He was different artists. And when it, when it came to pick an artist for the, um, the front cover of uh, Back Home, we actually um, made a short list of um, like um, a dozen of artists. And we said, okay, um, why don't we simply contact Matthias Noren? He's been doing a great job for us 17 years ago. Um, and it would be just great to work with him so, so many years later. So we contacted him. We asked him, okay, uh, here's, we, we sent him the album, the unmixed album. And we, sent, we said, okay, what do you think uh, about the album? Would you, would you like to, um, to design the, uh, the, the artwork, the front cover? And he immediately said, yes, I love your album. And I'm very much inspired by the, the music. And um, I'll be coming up with something uh, very shortly. And in fact, a couple of days after that, he sent us an email with a, a first sketch. And the first sketch was almost what you see uh, from the final cover. It, it was already almost perfect. We only made some minor edits, but uh, it, was, it was it. So yeah, we've been uh, very, very glad to have Matthias back on our, on our CD with, uh, with this new album. Do you have anybody like Travis Smith? Well, um, uh, we had a short list of artists, um, like 10, 15 artists, uh, which we picked on, on the web. Um, however, our final choice went to Matthias Norin, first because he's extremely talented, and second, we had been working with him, as I told you, um, on, on Tuesday. Was it Tuesday or yeah. Monday? Yeah. It was Tuesday. Um, we had been working with him with our very first album back in 2005, 17 years ago. Um, and he had done a beautiful job. And we had very good mo memories of uh, working with him. So, uh, unfortunately, we, we, we picked other artists uh, for, for the, the rest of the albums. But we said, okay, why not working with Matthias again? 17 years after. Um, and so, yeah, we, we picked uh, Matthias from the, the short list of artists that we had. Uh, and yeah, it was just, you know, it, it was just uh, obvious. It was the, the best choice that, that we could possibly make. Trevor Smith was not part of the short list. However, he was in the short list for Anima. Um, under guidance from our manager, we, we had considered Trevor Smith back in 2007 for the anima artwork and um finally we we chose another artist a german artist uh yeah so we eventually we never had the opportunity to work with uh, trevor smith uh, sadly maybe in the future yeah i noticed a lot of his artworks very abstract and dark yeah is that something yeah, maybe... you consider in the future do you think in one of your arm covers if we ever have a dark album, we might consider this artist, of course. We are not the darkest of bands. Um, even the darkest of our songs are not dark enough uh, to be illustrated by uh, this type of artist. So I'm not sure it will ever be a good fit for a very you know, experience. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. So how long is your contract with uh, the label Uprise Records, Uprising? Um, to be totally own, honest, uh, I don't even know. Actually, we, we signed it, but these are the kind of details that we leave to the manager. This is the way we have a manager for. Um, he's in charge of these things, and um, you know he, he's the guy dealing with every detail, and uh, he submits the contract to us. He, he said, okay, uh, I've been um, checking everything. Everything is okay. You just you guys just need to to affix your 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 signature on the bottom right of the final page and that's it so honestly i've been i've been reading it through but not in detail so i, I don't even know what's the the duration of the contract and the and the, uh, the detailed terms uh, but it's a fair contract and it's a very very good label so if we have to work with them again in the future i'll be the happiest man on earth right so you're very happy with the label so far obviously absolutely uh, they've been doing uh, an amazing job uh, since the moment we've been uh, signing with them. Um, from the moment we delivered the master tracks to uh, to the promotion right now, uh, they are extremely dedicated, as, as I told you. 
very serious label, very hardworking. Uh, they are in touch with us and with our manager on a daily basis. There is no day that we don't have any news from, the, from them. And this is, this is something pretty new uh, to us because, um, I mean, I'm glad that we've been working with the uh, Lansking from Nightmare Records and uh, Ken Golden from uh, Sensory. Uh, these are great guys with a lot of experience and very respected in the business. But um, to be f totally honest, um, Uprising has been so far the very best label that we've had uh, so far. They, they are working very hard. Um, yeah, as I told you, extremely dedicated. Uh, and this is, I mean, this is what a, a band needs, simple as that. So, so far, so good. So with them being a quite a new label, they're going to be hungry for good artists so they can promote, promote correctly. Yeah, the, from my understanding, the philosophy of uh, and the vision of uh, Uprising Records is to sign uh, upcoming bands, new bands, and old bands that, that need uh, to... Uh, to restart their career and we are the uh, the exact match for this um, philosophy because uh, we we have been um, inactive for a couple of years for even 10 years uh, except the live EP um, so we had to be restarted and uh, uprising is was the absolute perfect label for this mission Okay then, so I'm going to ask you then. So, what? Uh, how many videos are you going to be doing for this album? Promo videos? I know you've released one, two, two. Right, we, re okay. we we released uh, the very first single was uh, lyric video legacy. It was released in April. So, what do you think uh, of these these lyrical videos? What do you think of them? Um, well, <clears throat> I like them because um, it's a good compromise between uh, a full official video with a director and everything and um when you don't have the budget or time to make an official video it's great to be able to to make a video with uh, the lyrics because most of the time the lyrics are never get heard never get read so here they they have a um, they, they offer the opportunity for the fans to read the lyrics even the fans who don't buy CDs any longer and they don't have the booklet and they can't read the lyrics. So this is an opportunity to um, to um, highlight the lyrics, which deserve it as much as the music. Yeah. And it's the opportunity to have some kind of official video, even if even if it's not like uh, a, a, sh a short movie, it's it, it is not uh, made by a director. It's it's only some 3D effects and, and the lyrics, but that's, I mean, that's a good compromise. So actually we had two singles, Legacy first in April and then Where We Belong in uh, May. And um, we are extremely glad that we had a, a lyric video for Legacy because we, we couldn't afford two official videos. It, it, was, um, it was exceeding the budget for us. So we had uh, one official video, and the, the, the lyric video was um, a good opportunity for us to have two singles. So, yeah, I like this this format. This is something that I enjoy as a fan and as a musician. Are you doing any more promo promotional videos for this album, or is that it? Well, um, I, it is not planned for, uh, for now. So um, I'm afraid that there is no more videos. But maybe, once again, you, 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 never, can, you never can tell. Maybe we will make a, another lyric video. Um, w there will not be any more official video, that's for sure. But there might be some more lyric video on another uh, single track. This is not yet sure. Right, that's okay. What it is. So, if you had the chance to tour this year, do you think you'd be touring this year? Are you looking at touring later on this year, or is it too early? Um, we are in in May. Uh, I'm afraid that if we had to tour for this album, it will be early. 2023 um i'm afraid it's too late now to book uh, a european tour for 2022 so um it, it's yeah it will most likely be early 2023 and who would you like to tour with if you had the chance support acts or headlining who, who, who um, would it be for you all the big big progressive progressive metal bands uh, of course uh we would love to be touring with dream theater symphony x 
um, Vengeance Plus, these type of bands, but um, the opportunities are few. Um, they are already they have already been touring this year, so I don't think that um, they have any tour scheduled uh, at the moment. We need to tour early 2023. Uh, so honestly, well. I won't tell any any band name because uh, this uh, the, these things are confidential until until they are not public. Um, but we have some ideas, and we will try to make them happen in the coming months. So, what bands have you toured with in your career so far? Which bands have uh, you toured with? Well, in terms of of touring, like like a, a formal tour. Uh, that is to say, uh, playing every night for a, sp a specific period of time, only threshold. Right. Okay. And and um, King Crow uh, from Italy in uh, 2013. So, in terms of real tour, we've been touring with those two bands, Threshold and King Crow. Okay. Um, however, we've been playing many festivals, and in those festivals, we've been playing with great bands like. Uh, um, Iced Earth in uh, Pro Power USA in 2008, Van Plas in 2011 in Paris, um, The Scorpion in uh, 2005 for the first wow. album. We've wow. been opening for The Scorpions. <laughs> wow. yeah. How was it, that for you? How did that go? Man, I, w I was, fr from a personal standpoint, I was 21 years old. I, I, I was a young boy. I was, I was almost a teenager. And um, and and you have to open for a legendary band uh, in a huge venue. It was in in eastern France, um, and there were ten thousand people. You know, I mean, when you're twenty one years old, you're not ready for this. <laughs> Absolutely not. But but we had this opportunity, and and we we went out on stage and and we played, and and that was a, a memorable experience. Really, a night to remember. Um, 10,000 people, um, a legendary band. It was, I mean, it was the experience of a lifetime, honestly. So, yeah, we've been touring, we've been playing with great bands and touring with cool bands as well. So, yeah. Did you actually get to meet the Scorpions at the end of the night? Um, nope. When you play with such legendary bands, they are, you know, they are one step ahead of you. And um, I'm not saying that they, um, that they don't want to hang out with young bands, but you know they are always um, doing interviews. They are uh, they have many many people in their dressing room, and you never you never can find ten minutes you know to 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 hang with them and to have a chat. So they are always very very busy, and you are just a, a, a young opening band, and you don't even you don't even dare to knock at, at the dressing room door and say hey. You can can I can I just meet you guys? You just don't dare to do that because you, it, again, it's another world. You know, they are they are two, three hundred step ahead of us. So, I mean, I don't I don't even I don't even know if they they knew that there was some French opening band playing before them. It's just another world. They, I mean, they were too too far uh, ahead for us to 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 hang out with them. Maybe one day we had this opportunity again. Okay, maybe you do. I'm, I'm friends with Mickey D, so you might get a chance. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> never can tell. So, so when you when you like played in France, what French bands have you played with? Have you support played with Adagio, Lalou? Unfortunately, not. These are great French progressive metal bands that we know that we've been listening to, that we respect a lot, but we never had the opportunity to play with them in those uh, twenty years of of music. It might sound crazy, but we never had the opportunity. We are not based in the same area as France. We are in the uh, southeast of France, in French Riviera, next to Italy. Uh, Adagio is uh, north of France, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Lalu is like uh, southwest. We are for, France is quite a big country, and when you are so far away from each other. Uh, it becomes really expensive to uh, to play together. You, you guys need to uh, travel long distances, and it's it, it, unfortunately, um, yeah, it never happened. We never had the, the chance to play with those guys. I really hope that in the future we can, because they are very talented, and yeah, it would be great. Well, it'd be great for you guys because like similar style of music as well. 
Yeah, it's the same audience. I mean, I guess the fans would be very happy to to have uh, a build with a uh, Adagio and sort you know experience a Lalu. But you know, someone needs to make it happen. Yeah. Um, it won't it, it won't be the bands because we are very busy and I mean we are not. This is not our job, but some booking agent needs to to make that happen. Okay then, Fred. I'd like to thank you for doing this interview. Um, be safe. I hope you like the album review I did for you. If you had a chance to read it, I'm not sure if you did. Yes, and I would like to thank you uh, wholeheartedly uh, on behalf of the band for the the sweet review and the sweet words. Um, this this is the reward for us for the hard work that we have been putting in the album. When we read such a positive review, it's like a, a reward to us and really the deepest thanks from, from all of us. You're welcome, Fred. So do you have anything to say to the people that will be watching this on YouTube before we finish? Um, simply, uh, thank you for watching this interview. Um, thank you for your support over the years. Uh, we hope that you will enjoy listening to Back Home as much of, as we've been enjoying uh, writing and recording it, and we can't wait to see you guys on tour. Right, thank you, Fred.